Okay. Um, welcome everyone to the LSU uh, virtual author series. And again, my name is Freddie Pitcher. I uh, am an author. Uh, I uh, am the author of the book entitled Breaking Barriers, A View from the Bench. And it was recently uh, released by the LSU Press last month. And I'm really excited about being here today uh, to talk to you about my book. It's a memoir. And, but first I wanna thank uh, the LSU Press for uh, believing in my manuscript and helped me to uh, turn it uh, from a manuscript into a book. And specifically uh, thank Elisa, uh, Elisa Plant, who's the director of the LSU Press also Catherine Kader, the editor, and James Wilson and Sonny Rosen for their marketing efforts to, uh, to help me to, uh, to get the book out and get to where we are today. And uh, first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a retired judge. I spent uh, nearly 15 years on the bench, uh, and I uh, was elected in three different courts. Uh, the first African-American elected to a judgeship in Baton Rouge in 1983. And uh, then I was elected to the first African-American uh, to be elected to the 19th Judicial District Court, uh, uh, General Jurisdiction Court. And then I was elected to the Louisiana First Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and I also had a chance to uh, uh, serve as an associate justice ad hoc on the Louisiana Supreme Court which in turn uh, put me in a position to uh, serve at every level of the state court system in Louisiana. Um, but today uh, I'm here to talk to you uh, about my book and how I got to those positions. Um, and uh, I thought about initially writing when I was on the Court of Appeals, writing about black judges in general, because when I was elected in 1983, uh, I was just the seventh black judge in the state of Louisiana um, out of some nearly 180 judges. And as a seventh judge, black judge, uh, five of those judges were located within the metropolitan area of New Orleans. There's only two judges, black judges outside of that, that area. So, um, but uh, in, in 1983, um, I uh, ran for the Baton Rouge City Court. Demographically, uh, I was not supposed to win. And uh, a lot of people were saying that, you know, you can run, but you can't win. Um, but uh, as it turned out, I uh, was uh, quite successful in mounting a campaign to in turn overturn those obstacles that that were in my way and you know i said i wanted to you know break the glass ceiling and we did so uh in my memoir i, I talk about how i got there and uh, because uh it, it it was a road it was a journey and uh, i borrowed from uh my friend dr tom durant who wrote the foreword of my book uh, when he said that it was not so much about the uh, where I uh, wanted to go uh, or the destination, uh, but it was also about the journey. And that's what I want to, we talk about the journey and how we got to those particular uh, positions. Um, so uh, in, in March of, um, in March of uh, 20, I, um, when the pandemic hit, I started to uh, think about writing uh, uh, the book that I had said that I was going to write way back when I was on the Court of Appeals. And a friend of mine had uh, convinced me that, hey, look, you don't need to write anything globally about Black judges. Your uh, journey and the things that you've accomplished, they were compelling enough 
for you to write a memoir about how you got to where you uh, ended up at those positions. So when the sitting at home uh, now uh, during the pandemic and starting in March, you know, you can only watch so much of Gunsmoke and Wagon Train and, and Murder, She Wrote on TV, uh, I pulled out some things and thought about writing. And uh, I, uh, Googling memoir, I uh, found uh, Mary Carr's book on the anatomy of a memoir and read it and uh, was inspired to, uh, uh, to lay out a plan on how I wanted to write this memoir. Uh, she suggested in that memoir that you read uh, other memoirs and I started reading a lot of books. And so uh, based upon that, uh, that anatomy of the memoir by Mary Carr and the other memoirs that I got, you know, I started writing. And, but, the, but my darling wife uh, pulled out two boxes of uh, newspaper articles and memorable, uh, campaign memorabilia that really made uh, this writing process much easier uh, because you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book. They, they have to research, you know, it doesn't come by osmosis. And so here it is, I had this trove of uh, a stuff that I could in turn go through, which in turn helped me to in turn put my memoir uh, down. And I started typing and in uh, from March of uh, 20 to uh, uh, March of uh, 21, some uh, one year later, I had a manuscript of over 60,000 words and over 200 pages. And I was uh, really uh, pleased to have the LSU Press to uh, uh, take a look at it and, uh, and we it turned it into a book. So what's in the book? Again, the book is about my journey. And I uh, start off uh, uh, talking about uh, my growing up in a segregated uh, kind of community, a uh, place called Valley Park. Uh, but before I do that, I, I want to read to you uh, just something from the prologue. <clears throat> um, and in the prologue, I call it a night of an anxiety and jubilation. At 6 p.m., it began to get dark. The pose would close in two hours. I had done all I could do by that point, so I had made my way to clean up get my wife, Harriet, and our 11-year-old daughter, Kyla Dean, and head to the hotel to await the election returns. It had been an exciting but roller coaster day. After riding out an early morning rainstorm full of thunder and lightning, Lewis Hamilton and I drove back and forth all over the city, checking on voter turnout at key voting precincts. My campaign political consultant, David Roach, had crunched the numbers provided by our poll watchers and assured me that we had this election in the bag. Our get out the vote effort appeared to be working. Now we had to wait for a confirmation of Davis encouraging precincts analysis. I told Harriet and Kyla that it looked like I would win the city court a judgeship. Excited, we headed to meet our supporters. Hopefully that would be one of the one to crack the white judicial glass ceiling in Baton Rouge. And I go on to, to write that uh, as the voter votes rolled in, I fell behind immediately. Where the early return showed that it made some headway into the city, predominantly white precincts. It was still an open question as to whether 15% of Baton Rouge white voters would place a black judge on the bench in 1983. My opponent, Bill Weatherford, like, who like me was a former assistant district attorney and attorney general, had a commanding lead and my family and my supporters and I began to wonder 
if David's calculations had been overly optimistic. Kyla asked me if I was losing. Despite my assurances to the contrary, she could not keep from crying. Since most of the black precincts had yet to report, the agonizing wait, the agonizing wait uh, continued. Once those toes began to roll in, however, my opponent priest lead started to shrink. Cautious optimism filled the room. More than 20% of the vote still had to be tabulated. My victory hands down a turnout in the precincts uh, the politicians called Big Bertha. And when those votes for Big Bertha rolled in, you know, I moved out in front and all of a sudden I, uh, I jumped ahead and uh, it was quite an exciting day. First time a black person had won an election in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, I, I write, as predicted, once a return from Big Bertha came in, the last precinct out of a total of 95, I got, I not only caught up with my opponent, but surged ahead. My family and I were elated. It appeared that my candidacy would prevail, even though the local demographics were not in my favor. I garnered 57% of the total vote to Bill Weatherford's 43. In the end, I won 23% of the white vote when my target number was only 15%. It was a real gratifying uh, time that night. Uh, we celebrated uh, uh, through the night. Um, and another thing that I write before moving on, having stayed in the suite all evening, I had no idea what awaited me in the hotel ballroom. Much to my surprise, I was greeted by a tremendous crowd of well-wishers, reporters and television cameras. Someone grabbed me by the arm and rushed me through the crowd over to the press, abruptly separating me from my wife and daughter. It was not until the, the moment I realized my historic victory came at a cost. I had not considered the loss of my personal privacy. Renowned civil rights activist and Georgia State Representative, State Senator rather, Julian Bond, chairman of the NAACP, was also in the ballroom that night celebrating my victory. Now, this was really, really a big thing at that time. The, the city of Baton Rouge looked like it opened up and came uh, out to, uh, to uh, celebrate with us that night. Um, and I closed by saying that I, I asked myself how it happened that a kid who grew up in the segregated subdivision of Valley Park in the 1950s and 60s could rise to such heights. And then after that, that's when I go into how it all began and I go through uh, growing up in Valley Park and what some of the things that uh, I experienced uh, as a, in the segregated South at the time. Uh, I talk about school days, attending McKinley Senior High School uh, playing on the football team and becoming the captain uh, of the football team in my senior year. Um, I talk about my parents who, who really, really were uh, uh, very important in my life and uh, were great uh, examples for, for me, notwithstanding the fact that neither were high school graduates, but I, I described them as, as being um, strivers, you know, who really strive to uh, overcome the barriers that had, was set there for Black people at the time. But one thing I also write about now, and, and uh, it is, is also uh, uh, the bench in front of Orange Grocery Store, where I spent a lot of time with a lot of the boys from Valley Park. Um, we, there was no, uh, playground for us at the time, and we all used to meet and congregate there at the store. Uh, we had a, a seating hierarchy where the older boys got a chance to sit, sit on the benches, and the younger boys, uh, they had to wait their turn. And I eventually got to the point where I, I was able to take a seat on the bench. But sitting on the bench were times when we would talk about what we wanted to be and what uh, and how we were gonna get there. Um, so those 
the, the grocery store in Valley Park, Orange Grocery, just meant just so much to me. And uh, matter of fact, the original title to my bench, uh, to my book, rather, was from the bench to the bar to the bench. And basically, what I was trying to do was to connect my sitting on the bench there in Valley Park uh, to the bar, which was becoming an attorney and to the bench becoming a judge. Uh, but, you know, after we started, you know, doing the book uh, with the LSU Press, we kind of, you know, settled on, well, maybe that's a little too nuanced. What we'll do is uh, from the uh, breaking barriers of you to the bench, and I'm, I'm real happy with that. Um, but another point that I make in the book is how important it is to have as a youngster to have a role model. And my role model turned out to be Alex Pitcher. Uh, Alex was an attorney. He was in the first uh, graduating class from the Southern University Law School. And uh, Alex was involved in a lot of civil rights activities in, in Baton Rouge. Uh, and he used to visit our house quite a bit. And I was very impressed with Alex. And the people in the community were, were impressed with Alex. And, uh, Alex ended up uh, being uh, prosecuted and having his uh, license uh, taken from him. And uh, over a trumped up charge that dealt with uh, client funds, um, which you know he always contended that he was entitled to the funds. But um, I, I ended up uh, at a, a party one night, uh, an elected judge, white judge uh, asked me about Alex and he told me what, what happened. Uh, Alex was prosecuted uh, because of his civil rights activities. And that was something that I write about and some of the things that, that he had done and things that he had accomplished. But, you know, I, I, that's when I started thinking, you know, I really want to be a lawyer. I really want to, you know, try to, uh, you know, combat and overcome some of the things that that uh, that you know he faced uh, and uh, you know just take up the mantle for him. Um, I talk about my college years uh, in the book and uh, and and uh, going to Southern as and uh, majoring in political science. I initially started off majoring uh, in architecture, but I, I soon learned that I had no uh, talent. Uh, to be an architect, and uh, you know, I kind of veered off what I wanted to be uh, into an area that uh, I should have been. But when I went back to uh, thinking about wanting to be a lawyer, you know, my grades skyrocketed. I did every, everything started to turn well for me. Uh, I even got a chance to participate in a program at Yale University for six weeks, which was actually transformational for me. Going to Yale that summer, uh, I experienced some things that uh, was just tremendous. Uh, and matter of fact, it put the first time I was in an integrated uh, uh, academic environment, uh, integrated work environment, because it was a work study program, and I uh, worked part time at the New Haven City Planning Agency. So. Uh, that experience, you know, led me to believe that, hey, look, you know, I can, I can compete. I can, uh, and I came back uh, to Southern and, and, and Baton Rouge, uh, you know, ready to take on the world. I was ready to uh, uh, be the guy who uh, would, you know, do some heavy lifting. I uh, graduated uh, and uh, my first job uh, was with Community Advancement Incorporated, uh, the anti-poverty program. Uh, which uh, I moved up to the ranks there, I eventually uh, became the, the assistant director of neighborhood services. And, uh, but somewhere in between that, I, I spent a, a two year stint in the army, but I came back to community advancement and uh, uh, my time of working uh, in the community, uh, traveling all over Baton Rouge, attending community meetings, uh, really turned out to be quite uh, valuable for me when I eventually ended up uh, becoming a lawyer. Uh, but I own the law school and uh, in law school at Southern, I uh, uh, 
was elected uh, student bar president. And uh, that was, uh, uh, I actually won the job by one vote, uh, but um, I was the president of the student bar, which, you know, uh, gave me a, a lot of responsibility with uh, very little funds to in turn do some of the things that the folks in the bar, student bar want to do. But while I was uh, serving, uh, while I was in law school, uh, I ended up uh, getting a call from the director of the uh, from the di director of uh, community advancement, uh, telling me that he wanted uh, some people from the justice department uh, wanted to meet with me because of what had happened in Baton Rouge at that time. It was a riot on. North Boulevard uh, with involving some Muslim, black Muslims, and several people were killed. And, you know, so I'm in law school, you know, why do you want to talk to me? You know, I'm, you know, I wasn't on North Boulevard, uh, but uh, come to find out what they wanted was to have me and uh, an attorney and a lawyer, a law student from LSU, George Bailly, to run a rumor center. Uh, and that rumor center was uh, basically uh, done to in turn help to dispel, dispel rumors that were spreading all over the city about black Muslims attacking Baton Rouge from all different areas. Um, from that job, I ended up going, uh, uh, making my way to uh, becoming an assist, uh, uh, well, I passed the bar exam on the first attempt and uh, made my way on to becoming an assistant uh, a district attorney uh, in Baton Rouge. And uh, I uh, kind of made my way as, as, a, as an attorney uh, when I prosecuted the first capital murder case in Baton Rouge after Furman versus Georgia. It was a case uh, style, the state of Louisiana versus uh, of uh, James June Collins. And I, I bring this up because uh, this was the first capital murder case that was tried in Baton Rouge and the second capital murder case in the state of Louisiana after Furman versus Georgia, which was the case that in turn reestablished the death penalty. I was on duty, I was a duty assistant at the time and uh, I ended up being called out. Uh, let me read just a little bit about uh, how all this happened. Uh, I write uh, a weekend duty call that I will never forget occurred on a Saturday morning, November 26, 1976. I received a call that a young black woman's body had been discovered about 9.30 a.m. in the bushes behind the Five Crown Social Club a restaurant and bar in Baton Rouge. The young woman suffers a slash from her neck to a pubic area with a stab wound near her neck base. Blood spatter on a wall and the concrete slab at the back of the club indicated that she had been mortally wounded near the building and subsequently dragged into the bushes. The victim was found a brawless lying on her back wearing a pair of unbuttoned, unzipped jeans pulled down below her hips. A green sweater was also wrapped around her neck. Rigor, mor rigor mortis had set in. Ants were crawling over her body, indicating that the death had occurred several hours later. I joined the Baton Rouge police officers who investigated the crime. They secured the scene and quickly reconstructed the previous evening events from information given by some of those present at the nightclub. The victim was 18-year-old Karen Jackson, her boyfriend, Melvin Hurd, who had worked the club, identified her body. He worked as a bartender and waited, but occasionally served as the manager. This was a Black female who was murdered by a, a person who had committed, this was his second murder. Uh, he had spent 10 years in Angola for murder and had only been out of Angola for a relatively short period of time and uh, come to find out from people in the, in the neighborhood that even after getting out of the, 
uh, out of the penitentiary. He was a, kind of like a terror in the, in the, in the community. I, I took on the prosecution of this case. Uh, I thought it was important that uh, uh, somebody from Karen's community uh, speak up for her. And I was going to be that guy to do that. Um, I did not want to be somebody who would, you know, give him uh, just another tap on the wrist, or let him go back to Angola, which where he is serving this day. He's still in the penitentiary. But this was capital murder, uh, and he could have gotten the death penalty for it, which in turn uh, was kind of conflicting for me because I had not really settled on where I really was with the death penalty. But I wanted to convict this individual because of how, how uh, uh, atrocious this crime was. And uh, I never forget that uh, you know, after convicting him, uh, the death penalty cases is in two parts. First, you have the, um, uh, you have the first part is the, uh, the uh, conviction part uh, where you in turn decide whether or not the individual is guilty or not guilty. And the second part is the penalty part. Uh, the jury came back unanimously, they convicted him of first degree murder. Second of all, then you go to the, uh, the penalty phase and the jury uh, at this time uh, found him uh, uh, not to receive the death penalty, but he would get a life in, in prison. Uh, one of the things that I saw in this is how, uh, jurors, how jurors respond in, in such a time as trying to make a decision about the death penalty. Uh, and it informed me as to what I would do later on when I became a judge. Um, with uh, this background, I left the DA's office, opened a private practice, uh, which I had on the side. Uh, uh, I had a law firm, Pitcher Tyson, Avery, and Cunningham, and I decided to go into full-time private practice, uh, which I write about. I, uh, and then I write about a phone call I got. And in the book, I, it's called uh, The Phone Call That Started It All. Um, I've been toying with the idea of running for a judgeship. Uh, there were some 15 uh, judges in Baton Rouge, none were black. Several well-qualified black attorneys had run, but uh, to no avail. Uh, again, demographically, we did not uh, have but something like uh, a third uh, of, the, of the vote in Baton Rouge. Uh, but it meant that uh, you would have to have crossover votes from uh, white, uh, uh, citizen in order to in turn win. I, I thought about running uh, Judge Lewis Doherty um, after I tried a case before him, which I won. Uh, called me in one day and asked me uh, had I thought about running for judge and suggested I should consider running for city court. Um, it wasn't on my radar screen at the time because I was just getting my practice started. I was doing quite well, uh, had recently won a, a, a wrongful death case and uh, Sidney Hall and I uh, got a very large fee from it. And I had also uh, won a, a, another case that uh, where I'd gotten a rather nice fee from it. And, and I, was, I was doing good. I, I thought about running, but I really didn't want to run. Then uh, Reverend Ulysses Hayes, uh, contacted me and, uh, and Reverend Hayes was the uh, uh, president of the First Ward Voters League and he said the league, you know, wanted me to run and uh, that they would support me. And, but I got this call and the call came from uh, an attorney by the name of Bill Weatherford to ask me would I support him to run for city court. And Within a split second, I said, no, Bill, I can't do it. And he wanted to know why. I said, Bill, because I'm going to run. Uh, and therein 
became uh, the, the challenge. I had made this decision that I was going to run. I had to come home and tell Harriet uh, to get her on board to see whether or not she was on board. And because one other time I, I had mentioned to her about running and she said that you're ready, you're not ready. But when I mentioned this time, she said, you're ready. And we started mounting a campaign to run for the Baton Rouge City Board. Uh, we were able to forge together uh, black politicians who came uh, to support me and the black clergy, the black church played an instrumental role in, in, my, in my election. And I was able to put together uh, several of my white friends, white lawyers who knew me from my time in the district attorney's office, my time when I was uh, at the attorney general's office also. And these attorneys uh, put together a, a support group that uh, when we put everything together, the black politicians, the black church and these uh, attorneys, we, we, we forged a, a team that uh, helped to vault me uh, into a position where I became the first African-American elected to a judgeship. Um, I um, started city court and as a judge, uh, you know, thinking that, you know, everything was going to be a hunk of dory, but uh, I soon found out that uh, there were some people, you know, on, some on the police department uh, who really were not all that happy with having to answer to a black judge. And uh, that was another challenge, which in turn had to uh, uh, not bag down and, and be very forceful in how I handled the position and handle people who did not uh, uh, wanna, uh, see me uh, see a black person, you know, telling them what to do. Uh, we eventually prevailed, but uh, it was a it was a tough time bed at, at one point. Um, I um, after serving uh, as a city court judge, I uh, then thought about, well, you know, I want to move up. Uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court had appointed me as a uh, uh, district court judge ad hoc, but I served uh, a short period of time and and I liked it. I said, well, this is really where I want to be on the district court. Uh, my being on the district court would open up a seat on the city court for hopefully another black person to be able to use the skill set that I use in order to become a city court judge and I would join the district court. But again, the same challenge that I had, that is uh, now I would be running parish wide uh, for those who are not from Louisiana, which is, would be the county, um, I would be running parish-wide as opposed to the city-wide, which was a, a, a bigger challenge. Um, and it was a question of whether or not I could put my, uh, my team together that I had before. Uh, and fortunately, everybody who I approached about, look, I want to make this run, even though demographically folks are still saying that, you know, it can't be done let's put this together and uh, see about uh, running. And we did. We ran. Uh, and again, against the odds, we won. And uh, now I'm a district court judge. So I write about all of this. And, and, um, and, and uh, being a district court judge, I uh, were different challenges that I had. Uh, uh, at city court and I, and I write about those. And uh, uh, one of which is uh, dealing with, uh, as a judge, dealing with celebrity. Um, uh, what I mean by that, I, uh, I was on duty as a duty judge. And when you're a duty judge, it's your responsibility to, uh, you, you get all the cases that all the arrests and so forth that happened during your duty week would end up in your court. So uh, I um, ended up, uh, and one of the cases that I ended up with, uh, I write about it as follows. Of all the cases I presided over as a district court judge, three stood out 
and stuck with me the most. The first one was State of Louisiana versus Howard E. Rollins. Well, the defendant was an acclaimed actor from the television series In the Heat of the Night. And I go on to write um, that while sitting in, um, on Sunday, March 27, 1988, during my second rotation as a duty judge, I got a call from the court's bail bond coordinator uh, at East Baton Rouge Parish Prison, set bond on a man named Howard E. Rollins Jr. for possession of cocaine, a DWI, and driving 100 miles an hour in a 55 mile speed zone. Though, he, though the name sounds familiar, I didn't much think of it at the time. Our bond coordinator recommended a bond of $5,000, suggesting the amount was standard for the first offender. The following day, while sitting in chambers reviewing the stack of probable cause affidavits for the weekend arrest, I took a closer look at Ra the Rollins affidavit. I wondered if this might be the same person who started in a television series in the heat of the night. Drilling down a little more, I concluded that it was, in fact, the actor who was on location filming the series in Hammond, Louisiana. I couldn't believe it. Detective Virgil Gibbs was caught up in a real life situation in the criminal justice system in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I was an avid fan of Rollins, a two-time nominee, nominee for Best Supporting Actor in Movies, Ragtime, and A Soldier Story. I also watched the television series. I mused about his situation. I realized that he could very well be facing his own in the heat of a night episode in these charges. Dealing with uh, Rollins for two years uh, was a uh, kind of roller coaster situation in trying to get him uh, to a point whereby I didn't have to put him in prison. Uh, but it was a challenge. And finally, uh, when you read, read, you can read about it in the book, and you can't tell you too much more about it. Uh, I'm kind of telling you a little too much right now already. But uh, again, I, I wrote about uh, cases that I've uh, tried. Uh, and uh, another case of State versus Felter's Taylor was the first degree murder case uh, that I write about and uh, which was very, very uh, uh, interesting. And I think that you enjoyed, enjoyed the read on that. Um, I close uh, in the last, um, the second to last paragraph in, in the first chapter. I write, I think about the time I spent sitting on the bench in front of Owens grocery store, not knowing what my future held and marveled at what I'd been able to accomplish. Never did I envision that I would be elected to a judgeship three times over, nor did I imagine serving as an associate justice ad hoc on the Louisiana Supreme Court, becoming a partner in a major law firm and being named chancellor of a law school. Most of the boys on the bench would have been thrilled with a trip to New Orleans. To think that I would make, be making multiple trips to teach and lecture at law schools in Europe, Africa, and Asia was out of the question. On one of my trips to the Republic of Turkey, I received an honorary doctor of law degree from Seat University, an honor unimaginable during my days on the neighborhood bench. None of these things were on my radar screen growing up. However, I chose not to let the fog of a segregated society in which I grew up in dictate the chapters in my life. I stepped outside of my comfort zone and developed the fortitude to forge relationships through jobs and social networking and create opportunities for me to achieve my eventual goal of becoming a judge. God opened doors and I walked through them. I was happy to be able to uh, write this memoir because what I wanted to do was to have this memoir to serve uh, not only as a, a record for history, uh, but also the memoir has educational values, I think, and also inspirational values for young men and young women uh, to let them know that uh, their 
zip code uh, does not dictate where they can end up in life. Um, that's why I went back to and to Valley Park, where I came from, a segregated uh, area of town. Didn't get a chance to in turn get involved in anything uh, in an integrated situation for uh, until I became an adult. But yet but still, um, I was able to prevail in situations that uh, people thought it couldn't happen. And I say to those youngsters that it can be done, you can do it, uh, especially if I did it during my time. Uh, now, I think that uh, I, I will throw it open for Q&A. Uh, Sunny? Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for that, that wonderful discussion. Uh, we have a lot of great comments in the comments section here. Um, and uh, one of our viewers, Coretta, uh, actually sent three questions. So we're going to uh, tackle those first. Um, the first question is sort of a yes or no question, which I think um, I know the answer to. But um, she was just wondering if you ever still practice as a judge to fill in when there are temporary absences on the bench. Um, I it wasn't clear. Would you re repeat it? Yeah, the question is, um, are you still practicing as a judge to fill in when there are temporary absences on the bench? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, I am I will be sitting as an associate justice on the Louisiana Supreme Court on September 8th. I've been appointed to uh, sit in uh, for uh, the chief justice who had to be recused on a case. And so, yes, I do from time to time. As a retired judge, uh, uh, I'm assigned cases and I still sit. Thank you so much. Next question is about um, HBCUs. Um, Coretta said HBCUs are experiencing a rise in applications and students right now. Um, and so the question is, how do you think your HBCU experience helped you or maybe didn't help you? Well, I think my, my HBCU experience really uh, helped to ground me in uh, realizing that, uh, you know, I, I needed to, to, to do something that would in turn and not only help myself, but help my people. Uh, it's, uh, and there's a very nurturing aspect uh, about the HBCU experience and uh, uh, for those persons who uh, went to a Southern or a Dillard or a Howard, uh, they find that, uh, you know, sometimes when you may start the journey and you're not as prepared, you have uh, professors who uh, will take time to help to get you uh, where you need to go. Um, you know, uh, I, um, I just think that I came out uh, feeling that I was, I was very well prepared to do what I ended up doing. And, I, and, I, and really that, that short experience that I had at Yale uh, really helped to convince me that my HBCU experience and education uh, was pretty good. Uh, I was able to hold my own in a number of uh, discussions and research things that I was doing. So there it is. Thank you so much. Um, Next question from Coretta, um, it says that military veterans are often leaders in the community and in the civil rights movement. Um, how do you think that being in the service experience uh, impacts future leaders? Um, it, it helps with, you know, you, it builds leadership experience. Uh, and I was uh, fortunate that I served in the army and I became uh, uh, rank, attained the rank of sergeant, uh, E5, um, a squad leader, uh, and it, you you were in charge of men, and you you trying to uh, uh, lead people and get them to in turn follow orders. You 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 the military experience, uh, especially when you're in leadership, you know, it carries over out to when you get out into. Uh, uh, the world, uh, you learn to lead. And uh, I think that, that, that that's important. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is one that you may have gotten before at these events, but it's one that I know folks are curious to hear about. Um, are there lessons from this book in particular that you're really hoping that young professionals, whether they're in the legal field or otherwise, 
um, will take away and learn from you. Um, and of course, I know you don't want to spoil too much. I know there's more people will get from reading the book, um, but can you talk a bit about what you hope future generations will learn? Yes, I, I think that uh, my becoming a judge, my election to uh, all three of my judgeships was based upon my preparation for the uh, the challenge and uh, the experience of being a judge. And that's when I go, when you go back and all of the positions, the jobs that I had, the, the people that I was involved with, uh, was all about preparation and building uh, and getting yourself ready to, uh, uh, to, 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 to take on uh, challenges that you have. Uh, being the best that you could be uh, in school. Um, you know, and I talked about this in, in the book, you know, when I was uh, in high school, I initially didn't start out, you know, trying to be a, be a good student, but then it changed, you know, I, I had an epiphany and, you know, things started to change for me. Um, and, uh, you know, when I went to college, I, I did well when I was in, uh, and in law school, I finished number two in my class. And it's all about preparation. It's all about trying to be the best you could be. And becoming an attorney, um, you know, you you know, passing the bar. I passed the bar on the first time. And at that time, it was very difficult for Southern graduates to uh, to pass the bar on the first go round. But I also tell folks that uh, even I passed the bar on the first go round. There are several of my uh, colleagues who graduated with me, uh, even though they didn't, uh, they're millionaires now, you know, and, and I'm not one of them. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I believe in, 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 in preparation. Another thing is when I got ready uh, for when I was elected to the Court of Appeals. Uh, before I went to the Court of Appeals, I made it a point to prepare myself for it. I had about uh, a three month uh, a window before taking, uh, getting to the court. Uh, I went to several writing uh, seminars to, uh, to make sure that I was ready for the task. And that's what you have to do. You have to get yourself ready for what you're about to do. And um, so there it is. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is about writing of memoirs. So often when uh, our authors write memoirs, um, they have interesting experiences with folks who were featured in the book. Um, so have you had anyone who appeared in your book approach you or talk to you about their depiction or their opinions on, uh, on your writing about the experience? Well, um... One of the things that, uh, in, in writing um, the memoir, one of the things that I, I learned was that you, uh, you do uh, reach out to uh, people that you're going to, uh, to write about. For instance, uh, writing about my parents, I, I, I made sure that I talked to my brothers and sisters uh, to, to make sure that they was okay with what I was about to say. Um, uh, I talked to another uh, person who, uh, uh, I was writing about uh, their uh, uh, their husband and uh, the letter know that uh, what I was writing about and what I was going to say and if she was okay with it and and, and, and it turned out okay. Uh, other people that I wrote about, I didn't uh, contact them because you know I didn't see that I was denigrating them in any form of fashion. Um, and uh, but uh, so. Yeah, you, uh, you, you do want to reach out. Uh, this was not a book where I was, uh, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, throw somebody under the bus. Uh, this was my story that I was trying to tell that how uh, I progressed from uh, one point to another. And it was not about them, it was about me. And I hope that uh, the ones who I didn't contact understand that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know sometimes it can be when you're writing about family or friends, you know, it can be interesting to hear their reactions, you know, to their depictions. Right. Um, our, our next question is about um, courage and bravery. Um, a lot of our readers have, have talked about how 
uh, impressive it was that you were were doing this as as the first black person to do this um, and to hold these positions. Um, did you ever feel afraid to be stepping into these positions? And if so, how did you find that courage within yourself? I, I, I was never afraid of being a judge uh, at either one of the, um, at the city court, district court, or court of appeals, uh, because I really felt prepared. Um, and uh, matter of fact, I, I really thought that I was better prepared than some of you know people that I said who were my colleagues. Um, I, I I worked hard, uh, and uh, sometimes I may have worked a little too hard. I uh, never forget when I was on the on the on the district court, which you know I didn't put in the book. Uh, uh, a, a retired uh, judge uh, who was white and. Because I was the only black judge for, for six years. Uh, and I used to get called on for everything. You know, I don't care what kind of court it was. But anyhow, I was sitting in my office and this retired judge came by uh, to say, uh, hey, Freddie, how you doing? Uh, uh, is everything going OK? And I said, you know, yeah, I'm working to uh, I'm trying to get a hold on this docket, to get this docket in shape. And, and uh, because I was leading all the judges uh, for a couple of years in a number of jury trials. Uh, I was working hard. I was pushing my staff. And he said, you know what, uh, uh, you better, you know, slow down. Uh, you know, these cases are not going to go out anywhere. You end up having a heart attack and know what folks are going to say. Uh, they're not going to be talking about how well you kept your docket. They're going to be talking about who's going to run for your seat. I said, oh, oh I, I guess you're right. Uh, I uh, then uh, kind of slowed down. But I wasn't afraid about not being able to do the job. I knew I could do the job. Um, I uh, had a neighbor who was uh, told me one time she was very uh, afraid for me because she used to see the police cars pulling up to my house. Uh, and I had to explain to her, well, you know, as a judge, I signed warrants. and. Uh, and when on the duty judge, they come to my house to get after hours to get uh, uh, warrants signed. So, but again, it goes back to a preparation. That's what I always tell my students. Uh, you get only get out of the pipeline, but you, what you put in it. That's so interesting because I think the question initially was about you know being uh, afraid for your safety in oh. a in a world in a world with you know racism and and violence. Um, and it's so interesting that you immediately went to like, I wasn't afraid that I could do the job, you know, and I think that really speaks to um, to how prepared you were for, for the positions. Um, our next question comes from an audience member, uh, Cynthia. Uh, the question um, is specific to Baton Rouge. Uh, do you believe that growing up in Baton Rouge uh, in particular prepared you for greatness? Um. Baton Rouge is a very interesting place, and um, and I, I I used to really think you know well you know this was a great place to grow up. I still do. Uh, it's just so much has been happening of late that uh, kind of dampens your uh, thought about you know what's going on in the city and what's going on uh, in the in, in the in the world. Uh, but. Um, Again, Baton Rouge is a very interesting city because, you know, when I was working uh, with community advancement, uh, the poverty program, uh, that program really did a lot for race relations in Baton Rouge. That and I don't, don't think that folks ever really stopped to to give that program the due that it it deserved. Um, I was able to work with uh, a lot of people uh, across racial lines, and they there was a, a big effort in order to uh, bridge, you know, gaps between the races. Some uh, some worked, some some didn't. But uh, I, uh, you know, it, it's it's 
still good. I support uh, Mayor Broom and, and what she's trying to do, uh, uh, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Thank you so much. We also have a second question uh, from Cynthia. Um, it is more of a legal question uh, for all the law folks uh, in the crowd. Uh, the question is, uh, did you believe at the time that Clark v. Louisiana would so greatly impact the trajectory of Black political and judicial leadership in Louisiana? Yeah, uh, Cl Clark, Clark v. Louisiana uh, uh, really was a transformational case. And um, when I was a city court judge, and I write about this in a book, how Janice Clark and Murphy Bell uh, came to city court to uh, talk to me about filing the, uh, that lawsuit. Uh, and at the time they wanted to include the city court uh, as part of uh, that suit. And I suggested, I said, look, I have no problem with that. You know, uh, I said, but you may want to leave city court out at this time primarily because what they're going to do is use my win uh, as something to say that, uh, well, you know, whites can, uh, well, blacks can, can be elected and there's no need to, uh, you know, uh, have sub districts. Uh, but uh, Clark V. Edwards didn't come to uh, reality until uh, some five years later. Um, I had been on the bench within six years uh, by the time Clark V. Edwards came about. Uh, but Another thing what, what happened in that case, which I write about, and I credit Janice Clark and uh, uh, her cohorts uh, for uh, realizing that they had got to an impasse with the case and it needed to settle. And uh, that case ended up settling as opposed to going all the way through uh, the litigation process, because had it gone through, uh, it was a companion case with the LULAC case in Texas. The United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals killed the LULAC case, and uh, 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 Janice Clark and Ernest Johnson, uh, you know, had the wherewithal to uh, uh, to settle uh, the Louisiana case. It, where it did not, uh, you know, have the LULAC uh, in uh, happening to it. So yes, it's transformational. Did a great thing. Uh, as a result, right now in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, for instance, uh, take the district court. The district court have 15 judges, nine of which are are black. Um, back during the time when it was just me. Well, thank you so much. Um, we could ask you a hundred more questions, but we have reached the end of the hour. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and say goodbye to our audience. Hello, well, thanks everyone for uh, coming aboard and uh, buy the book. Uh, I think there's a lot in it that uh, you would be surprised at and things that would uh, uh, really uh, find educational and and again, for young lawyers and lawyers to be, and for folks who uh, just you know need an uplift, uh, I think we have something within the body of the two ends that uh, that, that will help to inspire you.